Hi, everybody. Um, in 2016, I received an email from Dale Leckie asking if I would chat with him about uh, how to publish a book. And uh, I thought to myself, who is Dale Leckie? And so I said to my husband, who happens to be a geologist, which is convenient, have you ever heard of this guy, Dale Leckie? And yes, he had heard of him. It turns out that uh, Dale's a pretty big name. In fact, he's quite outstanding in his field. He's worked at the Geological Survey of Canada and as a chief geologist in a large Canadian energy company. He has edited numerous books and published widely on the geology of Western Canada. He is adjunct professor in geoscience at the University of Calgary. So I thought, okay, this guy's legit. Maybe we'll get together and have a chat. So we uh, got together at a cafe. I came armed with everything I know about publishing a book. Um, from barcodes to printing, to distribution, to marketing, and everything in between. And Dale did it all. And the rest is history. Dale's first book, Rocks, Ridges, and Rivers, Geological Wonders of Banff, Yoho, and Jasper National Parks was published in 2017. And now the Scenic Geology of Alberta, which has taken number one spot in Calgary and Edmonton for multiple weeks in a row. And I can see why as Dale's passion for Alberta's story from Proterozoic to present shines through on every page. But before we get started, Dale, I have a question for you. Geology is quite complex and technical. How did you make it accessible in your books? I worked pretty hard at that, I think. Um, I, I would go to the library, the digital library, obviously I would research just about every sentence that's in there. And I tried to make it so that everybody could understand it. Your husband, the scientist, the geologist, as well as my grandkids. And I, that was my goal, so that it was appealing to everybody. And it was a tough one to do, but I think it's worked out. And it's by trying to keep people interested, having great graphics and, and, and the photography that goes with it. Exactly. And, and what I really love about the book is how beautiful it is. Um, not only your photographs, but the original artwork um, and your images. So what inspired you to add original art to your books? Oh, the digital art to the books. We must be honest, Laurie. It was your recommendation. But <laughs> I didn't I didn't plan that question for me. No, she did not, but it was <laughs> truthful. Laurie was my mentor for both books, and she's just great to deal with. Um, but the idea was, it, after I got over this concept of um, trying to get artists, I wanted people to look at the landscapes through a different set of eyes than what I was doing. So what we're trying to do is you can look at the, the landscape through the eyes of a scientist, the geologist, me, and the artist, and that was the goal. And I think it's worked. People really like, they really enjoy the art. They like to see the geological, the scientific story that goes with it. That's great. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Dale. Uh, take it away. Hey, thank you very much, Lori. Thank you very much, Jun. I'm gonna take control of the screen. So what I want to talk today to you about is a bunch of Alberta's landscapes. They're splendid landscapes. Well, let's just, sorry, I got a little distraction here. I have to hide something. Okay. Um, what I want to do today is talk about the scenic geology of Alberta. And that's a story of unbridled power. It's a story of drama. It's a story of glaciers and volcanoes long past. And it's a story of when banks fail. And we're gonna weave that all into the geology of Alberta. Oops, sorry, it's moving slow. So a few shots just to show you some landscapes. Here's mud buttes in the prairies, central prairies, east central prairies of Alberta. Um, beautiful spot. And you can see these features. Uh, they've been pushed, they've been thrust by the glaciers that covered Alberta 12 to 15 to 20,000 years ago. Go to Police Oast Outpost Provincial Park, and you can see Chief Mountain here. Yes, it's in the United States, but you're viewing it from a beautiful little park at Police Outpost Provincial Park. Go to Writing on Stone, Ice and Ipe National Historic Site, and look at the rocks and look at the look at the writings on stone there. Go to Dinosaur Provincial Park, and here's a shot of the hoodoos. Here's a place that very few people know about. Go to Sulphur Gates Provincial Recreational Area and investigate a water gap. Everybody's been to Waterton or knows about Waterton and they know about it, would like to go visit. I don't know why I don't go to Waterton. We'll go visit Vimy Peak at Waterton Lakes National Park. Here is probably one of the most spectacular river valleys we've got. 
in Alberta, uh, Milk River Canyon uh, in deep southeast Alberta, a beautiful spot. I just, I've got AV problems here. Um, Aretha Van Herc, when she wrote a blurb, we're moving slow. Aretha Van Herc wrote a blurb for my book to uh, say something about it. And she wrote these words, visible Alberta is stunningly beautiful, but the poetry of geology is its secret language, a transcendent stratigraphy. And I think that's a very apt statement of how we see and perceive geology in Alberta and meaning the landscapes. You go to Dry Island Buffalo Jump and there's that stratigraphy with the subtle colors and coal seams that you see. Um, and I think Aretha captured it very well uh, in, in her writing. Go to Red Rock Coulee and it's a moonscape if there ever was one in Southeast Alberta. And that's what I try and cover and that's what I try and talk about in the book, the scenic geology of Alberta, a roadside touring and hiking guide. And what I tried to do in the book was to cover as much of Alberta as we could all of Southern Alberta, um, Central Alberta, in through here, a transect across Edmonton and then into the, into the North, um, trying to cover as much as we could, get people out exploring Alberta at, in, during these times, staycation, stay in Alberta. And then like Laurie brought up, I was lucky enough to get two artists who, would co who contributed art um, to the book, landscapes that we were visiting, uh, Brent Laycock, um, does acrylics on canvas, and sometimes he does watercolors. He put eight of his paintings into the book. Lucy Carriou, uh, L.C. Carriou, um, did a series of watercolors, and we put eight of her watercolors, Landscapes of Alberta, into the book. And here's writing her, her vision, her view of writing on stone. So put on your hiking boots, fill your car with gas. It's time to explore and learn how Alberta's most scenic landscapes were created. We're gonna start with the scenic geology of Alberta is all about unbridled power. We're gonna to go to Waterton Lakes National Park to start this in Southwest Alberta. And here's the view from the Buffalo Paddock. And what you've got there are the Rocky Mountains, the leading edge of the Rocky Mountains and the foothills in front of them, very subdued foothills and then glaciated terrain um, in front of those. Uh, that's the power, it is, phenomenal forces that created this landscape. But before we go there, 1.5 billion years ago, this is what Western Canada looked like. And that's what we're talking about in Waterton, rocks that are 1.5 billion years old. And it was Alberta, Waterton was located south of the equator and it was harsh and hot at the time. It was not a very nice place, I don't think. Um, there wasn't a lot of oxygen in the seawaters or in the atmosphere. Sphere. There was some. Um, and at that time, 1.5 billion years ago, only algae lived. They ruled the world and it's hard to believe. Algae lived in the oceans. There was nothing on land at the time. And the algae would build up these colonies called stromatolites. And they would, there would be a, a layer of algae and then silt would settle on top of that. And then another layer of algae the next season or perhaps the next lunar cycle. And they would grow up. And you can see those in the rocks um, along the streams and the lake shore in Waterton Lakes National Park. So what are these algae? Well, on the left, you can see a larger, for, a larger one of these dome-shaped features. Looks like a big cabbage, but they also occur in the east, or sorry, in the east. They also occur in um, Western Australia, in Shark Bay. And so those, the feature you see on the, your left in the modern environment, there they are on the right. And Shark Bay is a very salty, shallow bay, not very much can live there. There's no snails to eat the algae. So as a result, you get these dome-shaped features that grow in Shark Bay. Just a picture to show you what Waterton would have looked like 1.5 billion years ago. And those rocks form the oldest rocks in the park, or they occur, the, sorry, let's say that again. The, the, the stromatolites, those algae occur throughout the park, including here at Cameron Falls. And I, rather than putting my photo in, I put one of Brent's paintings in. Uh, just a beautiful rendition of the rocks in the village of, of Waterton in Waterton Lakes National Park. Now let's talk about that power. So here's Waterton and in the Southwest, you can see what I've shown in yellow. That's a mass of rocks that was 140 kilometers 
long, 40 kilometers wide. When those rocks were buried about seven kilometers deep, or sorry, those rocks were about seven kilometers thick and they'd been buried maybe 10 kilometers. Then they were pushed eastwards. So let's run, this is where they used to be, where the bright yellow outline is. And then they were pushed. And you just think of the forces that did that. That took place 165 to 60 million years ago. And that, that mountain building, that displacement took place at a few centimeters per year. And then we had 10 kilometers more or less of erosion that took place. Remember, that movement took place when these rocks were deeply buried. And then 10 kilometers of erosion, and you get that spectacular scenery that we see in Waterton Lakes National Park right now. So what's your takeaway from this little bit? 1.5 billion year old sediments, algae ruled the world at the time. There was those rocks in front of you in Waterton came from 140 kilometers to the Southwest. And then 10 kilometers of erosion took place to give you the mountains that we see there now. And that's power. Consider the forces that were involved. A couple more shots. So back into Waterton, you can see where the next two slides are gonna come from. And this is coming from, coming from Waterton River Valley viewpoint. And you just picture that thrust sheet moving to the Northeast at a few centimeters per year. Go around the corner, go to the bison paddock or the buffalo paddock, and you see the mountain front again. You see the glaciated material in front of it in the Rocky Mountain foothills, very subdued foothills, but it's stunning landscapes that the geology has created. Oh, more, on, more of that unbridled power, still in Waterton. Let's go to uh, Mount Blakiston. And in Mount Blakiston, which is just beautiful to look at, there is a layer of rocks and it's a dark, dark layer. Uh, it's bounded on either side by this white layer. And so the dark layer was magma. It was probably a thousand degrees centigrade. It probably flowed just like water and it was injected into the sediments. It was so hot that it altered the limestone on either side into marble. And that gives you that triplet of white marble, um, basalt, and then white marble be below. It was injected into those rocks just below the seafloor, hundreds of meters, maybe a thousand, uh, like a kilometer below the seafloor. Uh, I keep having a... Those rocks are 1.47 billion years old. So cartoon, maybe of how that formed. Uh, there we go. And what would have happened is rocks came up through that central pipe, magma came up and spit, went to the right where it says Purcell Sill. Then they started to cool and you start to get these beautiful feldspars in the middle of the sill. On the edge of the sill, you would get sort of a very fine grained rock, a very fine grained basalt. You walk along the creeks and the, the lakes in Waterton and you'll find rocks like that. You'll find rocks like this, this basalt with little holes in it. Uh, the pressure, the, the basalt came to the surface, pressure difference, um, and the basalt expanded and little bubbles were created. And you're seeing preserved bubbles from 1.47 billion years ago. Here is Brent's rendition of Mount Blakiston. I think it's beautiful. Let's go to the Porcupine Hills and we're still dealing with, with power. Let's go look at the Porcupine Hills from the Pincher Creek Lookout. So go to Pincher Creek and go a few kilometers to the south and there's a roadside pullout. And you can see these hills that most of us know about, the Porcupine Hills in Southwest Al Alberta. Why are they there? Again, it's all about the power. Again, you're at Pincher Creek and you're gonna look and do a panorama from west to east where that line is showing. You're gonna go from Frank Slide eastwards to the Porcupine Hills. And so you start on the bottom right, which is far to the east, you go to the left, and then you go continue to the left. And you can see beds which are dipping to the right. Then you go where it says west deep, dipping foothills, um, they're dipping to the left. You can see the Livingston Thrust, which is the leading edge of the Rocky Mountains. And the beds keep dipping to the west. On the top left, you can see the Frank Slide. That's what the viewpoint looks like coming from just south of Pincher Creek. So what you're looking at there is, sorry, is 
the Frank slide to the west, the Rocky Mountain foothills, this area called the Triangle Zone, which we won't necessarily talk about, except the rocks to the east dip to the right, the rocks on the west dip to the left, the beginnings of a triangle. Now, why do I talk about power here? Well, during mountain building, what's shown in green, that area that was the Triangle Zone, and it was several kilometers thick, it was pushed eastwards and it caused the porcupine hills to be lifted up and to be preserved. And that all occurred when the rocks are deeply buried in, in the Earth's surface. And again, consider the power and the forces involved with that. And some of the beauty that comes out of that is that head smashed in buffalo jump. So those rocks were brought to the surface, pushed up, they were eroded to give you the current expression, and you get these massive ridges in which the buffalo were, were mi migrated and pushed over the cliff so that they could be harvested by the First Nations people to live. We'll move on. The scenic geology is all about drama. We're going to start with a bit of drama at Writing on Stone Provincial Park, right along the US-Canada border, almost in the middle of the province. And Writing on Stone Provincial Park, Isonipe National Historic Site, is a story of drama. But before we get to the drama, look at some of the geology. It's got these beautiful hoodoos. It's got a big meltwater channel. It was catastrophically cut when a glacial lake, glacier lake drained to give you the, the, the valley in which mil the Milk River flows now. You've got the hoodoos. And remember, hoodoos are formed when you get differential or different varying degrees of cement. So you get very tightly cemented rocks as at the top of that cap rock resistant to erosion that the rocks below are not that resistant to erosion. And wind, snow, rain just erodes that hoodoo grain by grain to give you those spectacular shapes. You also see sometimes rattlesnakes there, all part of the thrill of going to Writing on Stone Provincial Park. So again, another view of the valley and of the river and of the cliffs. And what the geology is, is if you start at river level, there's mudstones deposited in a shallow sea um, about 80 million years ago. And then the sandstone cliffs, and that's where, where we're going to go in a minute, is where the, the, the writings, where the etchings are. And then at the top of the sandstone, at the top of the cliffs, there's roots and coals, and then river channels. That's what the geology is all about. So what did that look like 84 million years ago? This is what Southern Alberta looked like. There was a shallow sea, and there was a shoreline that was moving from south to north, it, where the water is blue, you could have sunbathed, you could have been swimming in the water, you could have been surfing, just to give you a picture of what things were about. You could have been um, using your paddleboard in the lagoon or the estuary. It's, it was this type of environment which gave you the sands that you see at Writing on Stone Provincial Park. If you go traipsing or taking the paths down through the hoodoos to almost to river level, and you have to do it on a guided hike, you can start to see the writings on stone. This is one of the battle scenes, and it's hard to capture in a photograph because you can see the scale bar. It's almost three meters across, two and a half to three meters across. So this is a drawing uh, by one of the scientists that did the research there, and it's it's a historical rendition of a battle that took place perhaps in 1866. One of the, a Pecani elder uh, named Bird Rattle said that this pictograph, this, this story, this edging, um, this etching in the stone uh, referred to a battle in which the Blackfoot people were being attacked by um, a group of Gros Vaux, uh, the Crow people and the Plains Cree. And what you see in there is you can see a camp of Blackfoot teepees, you can see a defense line of muskets, you can see an advancing war party. And there were about 300 in the war party, and there were horses with travois. This is a post contact, post contact um, writing in stone. What it means is they had the horses and they had guns, they had their muskets. So the Spanish came, they settled in southeast United States, uh, guns and horses eventually made their way north until sometimes late 1700s, late 1800s, when the First Nations people acquired both the horses and the guns. There's a picture, um, as best I could get, this is from Jack Brink, um, showing some of the muskets that you can see where they're coming from. And you can see 10 or 11 muskets, and they've 
drawn in the musket balls coming out of the muskets as they defended their camp. And the Blackfoot did defeat uh, the attacking war party. And then there's another battle scene. And this battle scene is pre-contact. And what, what it means is, or what you see is the warriors are on foot. The circles um, are set to represent bison hide shields, large buffalo bison hides um, that the warriors would carry. And they would carry them as they walked across um, the plains. You couldn't have a shield like that on a horse. Um, also, in there, there's no no evidence of guns in this scene. In this scheme, um, you can see a couple on the left side, a couple of um, inverted people. Those are probably dead warriors. And that comes back comes they think from about 1400 to 1600 uh, Common Era or um, AD, if you want to use that denomination. Here's Laurie's. Oh, sorry, Laurie. Here's Lucy's uh, rendition of Milk River Canyon, her watercolor. And I think she's done a really good job on that. More drama, Cretaceous gold and the lost lemon gold mine, murder and madness. Um, as you go up and down the Rocky Mountain foothills from Bragg Creek to the US border, there are a lot of gravels. They're called conglomerates because they're cemented gravels. And there's a story there. Um, that gravel is called the McDougal Seeger conglomerate. And this picture is from the Frank Slide Interpretive Center. And when you go to the Frank Slide Interpretive Center, you can walk on the ledge and you, or you can do the pathway and you can walk through these gravels. And so the story here is that there were two trappers, Black Jack and Lemon. Black Jack gave Lemon the ax, literally. He killed him with his ax. Um, Black Jack, after that, became unstable. He migrated down into Montana to the tobacco, tobacco plains and started talking about his story, his, what he'd just done. He, he became... Uh, quite upset, quite unstable. And then a, a series of characters with really interesting names, Lafayette French, King Beresbaugh, John McDougall, and the Blackfoot woman, woman Cloud Walker. They all worked, went out looking for the gold. Um, nobody ever found it. Um, there is said to be a curse because tragic deaths, fire, storms, serious illness are all, all seem to have afflicted those people who went looking for the gold. Now, when you look at the legend, you hear, see names like Dutch Creek, Racehorse Creek, um, Highwood River, Gold Creek. They're all affiliated with the legend of the Lost, gold, Lost Lemon Gold Mine. And they occur, again, from Bragg Creek south to the U.S. border. Now, in these rocks, which are 100 million years old, more or less, you can define a series of river, ancient river channels or valleys that contained this gravel. Some were a few kilometers wide, some were 20 kilometers wide. And in those rocks, and not meaning to get too much geology here, are these rock types, volcanoes, volcanic rock, and igneous rocks, very unusual in Western Canada, in the Rocky Mountains. Where'd they come from? They came from Eastern British Columbia, East Central British Columbia, where in purple, I've outlined what's called igneous plutons doesn't matter really what they are, but what's important for this story is all around there are gold occurrences. That's where the gold mines were um, in the late 1800s. Some of them are still active today. So those igneous rocks, those volcanic rocks, they flowed from the mountains eastwards for about 400 kilometers and with them came gold. The gold isn't very big, but if you can find some weathered material below some of these cliffs, gather it up, put it in your gold pan, go down to the creek, you'll get gold, gold flakes and you'll get platinum in the bottom of your pan. We're continuing the story of drama. Let's look at the origin of Okotoke. Um, Okotoke's erratic um, in Okotoke's just south of Calgary. And it's, it's beautiful, it's big, it's monstrous. It's, it's got quite a story. And its story is that it originated, those rocks and thousands more like them originated in Mount Edith Cavell in Jasper. At the maximum of the last glaciation, 18,000 to maybe 21,000 years ago, there was a landslide on Mount Edith Cavell. It, the landslide, the debris, millions of tons probably fell onto the glacier that was flowing eventually out through Jasper to Hinton and then it met the giant Laurentide ice sheet, the light blue on your right. And the ice was deflected southwards, leaving all of those rocks that we see scattered all through Calgary. Um, you, you see them 
Um, you see them in Okotoks, you see them in Nose Hill. Now, well, what did that look like? There's Mount Edith Cavell, and it is this quartzite. It's a kilometer thick. And what would have happened is something like the mountain there would have collapsed onto a glacier, such as we see here in this example from the Alaska range. You can see two landslides where the mountains have collapsed onto the glaciers. There's one in the foreground, and then just back in the distance, there's another one. So again, that material came out, Jasper went to Hinton and was deflected and pushed south all the way down into Montana. So why is Okotoke so broken up the way it is, um, the big rock? Okotoke, Okotoke is the Blackford, Blackfoot word meaning rock. And there's a story there. Um, Blair First Rider, a Blackfoot elder, related this one. Um, and the creator, um, Nappy, no, so sorry, it's a creation story. And Nappy, the trickster, at the time was going around creating the landscape. He upset Okotoke. And remember, Okotoke was the big rock. And there's a story to why he upset him, but that's for another time. Um, Okotoke began to chase Nappy, and Nappy was getting pretty worried. So he asked some bats to help him. And the bats decided, yes, we will help Nappy. We will crash into Okotoke. So they broke off a few pieces. Um, but as a result of that, bats crashing into Okotoke, that's why they have flat noses, flat faces right now. So Nappy kept running away. Okotoke kept, changing, kept chasing him. Um, Nappy asked some nighthawks flying in the area to help him destroy Okotoke. So they had a discussion. They said, yes, we will help you, Nappy. They started by blowing gas onto Okotoke. You can translate blowing gas uh, however you want, onto Okotoke, and they broke it up to give you the shape that you see there um, in the background. So that's, that's the creation story um, with the Blackfoot on how Okotoke came to be. Let's go to the neutral hills. Neutral hills are southeast of Edmonton, northeast of Calgary, in the prairies. Um, and what you see in neutral hills are a series of these ridges. And they're 100, 100, 120 meters high, elongate. They look like your Rocky Mountain foothills. Why are they there? So there's a Landsat image, um, Google Earth image of the neutral hills. And the yellow dot with the red is, is a great spot to take a look at them. And it's just a great place to go wander around. So what the story is, um, they extend across the prairies for 70 kilometers. They're up to 120 meters high. And they're so evident and visible that Captain John Palliser in 1857, when he was doing his expeditions in Western Canada, he noted them on some of his maps. So why are they there? It's glaciers. Glaciers were pushing them. Glaciers pushed the bedrock in a southerly direction, just like this. They incorporated, or some of the glacier ice got incorporated into that material, and it eventually melted out. But this is all a glacial story. Bulldozed bedrock, bulldozed material from when the glaciers were here 15 to 21,000, 15 to 25,000 years ago. And then when that ice melted out, it left you those lakes, which we call kettle lakes. So the neutral hills were long a territory to be shared. They were shared by the Crow and the Blackfoot people. Um, but at the same time, they were always fighting. They were often fighting. They were over land, over buffaloes, over berries. There were, lots of, there were lots of buffalo, there were lots of berries. There was winter protection from the winds and there was abundant firewood. Um, so the Great Spirit at one point became quite upset. So one night um, when the two nations were sleeping, he put his finger on the earth and he lifted up the earth to create those hills. In the morning, when the crow and the Blackfoot woke up, they, they were on either side of the neutral hills, they walked to that central gap in the middle of the photo where the highway is. They met there and they made peace. So that's one of the, it's an, what's called an unattributed story to the origin of the neutral hills. Wally's Beach, let's go look at Wally's Beach. More drama and a different type of drama. Uh, Wally's Beach is in Southwest Alberta, uh, near, between Karsten and McGrath. And it's a bleak environment. The wind seems to blow all the time. So we go for a hike within a late Pleistocene landscape 13,000 years ago, more or less. 
and it's on a reservoir, the St. Mary River Reservoir. So you can only go there in late winter, early spring to see what we're going to talk about here. And there are mammoth tracks. Those are mammoth tracks that the yellow arrows are pointing to, um, different, different um, pathways, and that's why they look differently. Um, they're 30 centimeters to 50 centimeters across. There's a mammoth track right there um, in the sand. Mammoth footprint, a single one. There's horse and camel footprints. Um, camel orig originated in North America, became and spread around the world, and then they became extinct. The horse footprints that we have here are prehistoric, not, yeah, they're prehistoric and, not, and extinct varieties of horses as well. So what's interesting here, and part of the drama, is 13,300 years ago, um, First Nations people butchered horses and camels. They found stone tools, the archeologists, have found stone tools with horse or bovid proteins. Bovid or muskox or camel protein, or a bovid is a muskox or camel, and they're not really sure which it is. So they found the tools and they found proteins to say that First Nations people were butchering these animals 13,000 years ago. Just a picture of some of the bones and some of the tools. It's an amazing place. And then this photo, um, obviously late winter, shows you how bleak it was. The mountains weren't very far away. Cold winds would have blown off the mountains, off the glaciers um, that occupied those valleys at the time. Um, the big Laurentide ice sheet that was hundreds to thousands of meters thick was maybe 200 kilometers to the north, but cold winds blew off it. So it was harsh and cold, windy all the time. Glaciers were still in the mountains. Um, probably there were very few trees. It was probably a, a very cold, grassy, steppe-like environment. You can just picture how miserable it would have been even in the middle of summer. Here's Lucy's rendition of Wally's Beach. And I think she's really, in my mind, and she might not agree, she's captured the harshness. Uh, that's what I see when I look at that, harsh and bleak. Um, more drama, dinosaurs perish, meteor impacts and never ending floods. So here we're gonna to go to Dry Island Buffalo Jump, uh, northeast of Calgary, uh, north of Troshu, north of uh, Three Hills. And again, beautiful colors in the Horseshoe Canyon formation. And in the eastern side of that photo or close to the eastern side of that photo, um, Albertosaurus, uh, an Albertosaurus bone bed has been found. Albertosaurus was a carnivorous dinosaur um, that eventually evolved into or was a precursor to the Tyrannosaurus rex. But you can see he was a pretty nasty person. And they came, they've been, 22 of them were excavated from some of the old ancient river sands, fluvial point bar sands in the ridges to, on the east side of the photo, a little bit further to the east of that. So tw I said 22, 26 species were found in those river deposits. The age of those species were two to 24 years in age. And because there were so many of them, that age range, um, the paleontologists think that they likely hunted in packed, packs. So think about a, a pack of 20 of those or five of these coming after you. Why are they there? Well, this is a herd of wildebeest, not a carnivore, but rather a herbivore from um, Tanzania. And it's tr they're trying to cross a river in flood. And the reason for showing this slide is to show you what happens afterwards. And this is probably what happened to the Albertosaurus, some version of this. The animals drown and they accumulate like this. The next flood comes along and the carcasses and the bones are all moved and accumulated. And that's probably what happened to give you those, that Albertosaurus bone bed. Across the river, um, still in Dry Island Buffalo Jump, they've recovered a fossil of an Ornithomimus. Uh, and it was a bird-like, dinosaur and kind of looked a bird mimicking, sorry, it, it mimicked dinosaurs and it kind of looked like an ostrich, they think. And it had feathers on it. More drama, 66.5 million years ago, a meteorite, an asteroid hit the earth. And when it hit the earth down in the Yucatan Peninsula, um, it created instant devastation globally. And where that event occurred in Dry Island and Buffalo Jump, just below the little coal scene, shown where the dashed line is. So when that took place, and again, we're talking about drama and geology. Um, when that took place, iridium, which pretty well only originates in space, it got sent around the earth from that impact, as well as other things called chalk quartz. We find them in some of these 
um, in this Paleogene Cretaceous boundary, um, just down the river, it's, it, the iridium and shock quartz has been found. So there's the bolide, there's the meteor coming into Earth. And when that happened, instantly there was giant fires all across North America. Darkness from the eject from the soot and debris sort of covered, it was, it was dark. There was nitric acid rain, there was sulfuric acid aerosols that cooled the earth. And then because that meteorite um, landed in a carbonate terrain, there was intense um, CO2 levels. And so we had insane global warming. At that time, 76% of all species perished on earth. That's an amazing number, 76% of all species perished. And then for 10,000 years, um, the paleontologists, uh, they, they, they think that it was ferns, the simple ferns were the dominant flora on earth. It was a cataclysm and it was instantaneous pretty well. Moving on, the scenic geology of Alberta is about glaciers and volcanoes long past. When Western Canada, when Alberta was glaciated last time around, um, the ice was up to four kilometers thick, and then it thinned in a southerly direction. If you draw a line from north to south, you can see that thickness from the Yukon border down into Montana. And it thin, thickened, or sorry, thinned from about 3,500, 3,800 meters thick down to nothing just at near the Alberta-Montana border. It was so thick that that ice flowed uphill. You can see in that tan brown color, the level of the land. It keeps rising from north to south. Give you an idea of the immensity of the glaciation that covered Western Canada. I want you to think about how much ice that is. You go back to that ice thickness map. That was about 2 million cubic kilometers of ice covering the province, back of the envelope calculation. What does that mean? It means that it would be create, it would be a cube 126 kilometers wide, 126 kilometers deep, and 126 kilometers high of ice. Think what that did when it was moving and sculpting our terrain. Even more so, think what it did when it melted to give us this landscape we have in Western Canada, in Alberta. Going back two and a half, 2.6 million years, we're just gonna cover this really quickly. I just want two things here. Um, Ed Edmonton was glaciated twice. It was glaciated about a million years ago, one point in the lower left corner, and it was glaciated 21.7 to 18,000 years ago. Calgary though, was only glaciated once. The ice, they think only covered us once. And it was a big one though. So if you go look at the last glaciation, what, and this was 21,000, call it 22,000 to 18,000 years ago, Alberta was covered up to four kilometers of ice. There were a, a few areas poking their noses, the tops of the hills above that ice, Cypress Hills and the Porcupine Hills in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and some more further south. And then the ice started to melt. You remember this, we're gonna come back to this one later when we talk about Calgary. And then the ice was gone. So let's talk about Calgary a little bit. Um, when I talked about the geology, the scenic geology of Calgary, I did it from Nose Hill. What we see at Nose Hill, you can apply across much of the west, rest of the province. We're just gonna talk a little bit about the glaciation that took place, here, took place here. Here's a shot from Hawkwood. Looking from Nose, you can see Nose Hill on the left. You can see downtown Calgary, Signal Hill in the distance, the Rocky Mountains, and then Cochrane way off in the distance to the right, to the, to the west. And I put a cartoon of those two ice masses, the Laurentide ice sheet, the great big thick one on the left side on the east, and just a lot smaller, what we call it the Bow River Glacier coming out of the Rocky Mountains. When that ice started to melt, it created a lake, and that lake was called Glacial Lake Calgary. And it, it had kind of an interesting story. My house is built on Lake Glacial Lake Calgary, if you're interested, and you're probably not. What it looked like and this is a, a, a rough rendition of Glacial Lake Calgary from Nose Hill or looking at Nose Hill and glacial, that glacial lake extended up to John Laurie Boulevard. It wrapped around Nose Hill up 14th and to the north. The University of Calgary um, was probably in 40 or 50 meters of water. Give you an idea of the depth. And if you go up 
just to the east side of Nose Hill, you can see where that blue line is. That is as high as Glacial Lake Calgary was. All of those high rises in the distance would have been covered in water. And then these are boulders in the foreground of the Foothills Erratic Strain that came out of more, um, Mount Edith Cavell. And we've already talked a little bit about that. So here's glacial, here's a little bit of the glacial story. First, the mountains came, the glacier came from the west, the rock the, from the Bow River, along the Bow River. And then it melted back. And then we had the Laurentide Ice Sheet. The two ice sheets met near where the Center Street Bridge is in Calgary. Then they started to melt. And you could see those lakes forming and reforming. And if you walk along the river valley here in Nose Hill area, Silver Springs, Beaumont, uh, Fish Creek, you can see these glacial lake sediments either over top of glacial deposits or older Cretaceous rocks. Calgary glacial history. If you're going to remember anything, just a few points. Only one glaciation. There was a kilometer and a half of ice in the Calgary area. Next time you go outside, wherever you live, look up 1.5 kilometers of ice. If you're in Edmonton, there's three kilometers of ice. And then the ice started to melt and we got, we got the lakes being formed. And the ice was gone 15,000 years ago. Let's go to Elk Island National Park. And it's these hill, knob and kettle terrains, lots of lakes, lots of little rolling hills like this. Why is that there? Some of the topography, beavers love the area. Buffaloes, lots of those are there. So what that story is, it's glaciers again. And the glaciers flowed and there were ice flows that flowed around where glacial or where Elk Island National Park is now. And Elk, where Elk Island National Park is now was a subtle little highland. And when the ice started to melt, there was a giant ice mass that stagnated on that upland. And when the ice started to melt, we, you, it, it melted to give you that irregular, irregular topography, that knob and kettle topography, all those lakes that you see in the background. This topography here, again, it's another glacial story. Glaciers melting. Go to Cold Lake, 90 meters deep, Alberta's second largest lake. And Cold Lake area, there was three kilometers of ice above it. And what happened in Cold Lake, again, it was the glaciers. The glaciers came, they, they pushed material from the lake, created a series of hills, which you see to the southeast of Cold Lake. And then they, the, lake, the ice direction changed and flowed in a southerly direction to give you those gray mat land masses. And they give us the topography that we see in a lot of Northeast Alberta. The next photo is from Muriel Lake. And from Muriel Lake, looking east, you see a hill that was bulldozed and pushed 35 kilometers by that ice. Again, spectacular terrain in that part of the world. You can see where the, that hill came from. Some of the features of some of these, these ice thrusts, these, these, these lakes, they've got long straight, long straight shorelines, very steep banks. If you live in Northeastern Alberta, you go to Primrose Lake, Saddle Lake, Wolf Lake, Sinking Lake. They're all formed by the same mechanism. Let's go to Southwest Alberta. We're gonna leave the glaciers and we're gonna to go to volcanoes long past, Crow's Nest Pass, 100 million years ago, 103 million years ago. And the best place to see these rocks are where that little yellow dot is, the yellow and red dot is. There's a ridge of rocks, Iron Ridge, that extends for kilometers to the north. Um, and when you go to that red dot, you can look across the river, the road. Don't cross the road, it's too fast. You're going to get hurt if you do. There's the Crow's Nest Volcanics, overlain by glacial till. And what the story is here, to give you that spectacular train that you see in this satellite image, is large volcanoes. There was a large volcano 103 million years ago. There were Nue Ardents, you can see the name in the right. It's extremely hot air coming down the slope of the volcano um, and it charred trees that were growing on the volcano. There are lava flows, there are debris flows. Uh, I've seen where you see the word bombs, I've seen bombs, some the size of a small SUV that were thrown out, not very far mind you, from where the magma was coming up or from where the lava was coming out. 
Where did that happen? That all took place in Cranbrook and it created volcanic rocks that were 300 meters high. And then with mountain building, those rocks were pushed eastwards to where they occur in the Crow's Nest Pass. With every volcano, there's always volcanic ash. And you can find some of that volcanic ash as far northeast as Edmonton. You can also go, if you look at those rocks, you can find garnets. And there's garnets there. They're called melanite garnets. Um, they're not very valuable. They're not very hard. They're low temperature, low pressure garnets, but they're lots of fun to find. And you can see them scattered through the rock in the, in the picture there. And you can see some of that I collected from below that spot. Volcanoes long past. Let's go to the Red Deer River Valley. Um, let's go to the little hamlet of Dorothy. And the sky went dark. Again, volcanoes. This volcano was southeastern British Columbia, maybe in Washington. And an eruption took place about 74 million years ago. And the eruption spread a plume of ash northeastwards. Uh, there's up to 13 meters of ash. So you can imagine everything below that ash cloud there went extremely dark. There's two churches that you look at. One is the United and the other is the Catholic Church, the Protestant and the Catholic. Oops. And look at the scenery, look at the landscape. There's that ash. It gives you that nice light gray color in the Red Deer River Valley. Let's go north. Volcanoes long past. Let's go to the Buffalo Head Hills. And we, in the book, I don't take people to the Buffalo Head Hills, but I want to talk about it because it's an interesting part of Alberta's history. There's diamonds there. And in the Buffalo Head Hills, there were volcanoes, um, that kimberlite volcanoes, and they came to the surface at the time and they brought diamonds with them. It's the only reason I throw them in the book. It's too isolated, too hard to get to, but it's a neat part of the story and you can see it and envisage where it is from the outlook from the Sagittawa, out, um, Sagatawa outlook in just above Peace River. The scenic geology of Alberta is all about when banks failed. So we're gonna to go to Edmonton for this one. Start in Edmonton. Um, Edmonton is built on a glacial lake, just like Calgary. And it's been dissected by a river, the North Saskatchewan River. Uh, it's got a very sinuous meandering pattern. And that's what gives you so many of the parks and gravel pits or old gravel pits in the city. But it also creates a natural hazard. Um, Edmonton's built on this lake plain, glacial lake plain, much like downtown Calgary is. And it formed by, it formed when, when sorry, I'm looking at the side of my screen. Um, it formed when there was ice all around the area and it was basically an ice dammed. Krista P is driving on, is, is drawing on my uh, image here. Uh, sorry, um, it's, an ice, it's an ice dammed, ice created lake. And if you go to, to look at Twilliger Park, which you could see is the flat lake bottom. That's what most of the city's built on. And then the river has entrenched into a river valley, the Edmonton River Valley. And what you're looking at there is Twilliger Park, and Olescu River Park. And there they are there. And what the river does is it meanders. The fastest part of the river meanders from one side where the red is going across to the other side. And then back on the other side, you can follow the red dotted line and see where erosion occurs, see where deposition occurs. Where deposition occurs makes great gravel pits. Later on, those gravel pits are reclaimed and they become parks in both cities. Um, and what happens where the erosion takes place is really interesting. Um, you get lots of erosion and bank failure going on in Edmonton. And that bank failure is due to undercutting by the North Saskatchewan River. You get slumping going on. And you can see where I labeled the word bentonite. A bentonite is a volcanic ash. And a volcanic ash, when it gets wet, gets extremely slippery. And that's where these landslides that we're gonna look at take place. There's a picture of a volcanic ash or one of those bentonites. A thicker one would be very, very slippery surface. Here is the end of the world, Keeler Point. And you can see down drop blocks that occurred at various times. There used to be a road there, it's gone. Keeler Road faulted out of there. 
And now it's a little park where people can go and look at the river, go look at the river valley and those slopes. Go to downtown Edmonton, go to Grierson Hill. And it's really interesting. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful river valley, a beautiful river bank. That area there is all old landslides. The landslides occur because of the North Saskatchewan undercutting the river. Remember I said erosion. There's those volcanic ash, line, ash layers. There's coal mines scattered all through Edmonton. There were a dozen coal seams and they were mined. Water gets into those old mine shafts and softens the rock. Um, groundwater seepage and residential development all contribute to the landslides. Grierson Hill, 1900. The land, there was a coal mine. Um, displacement took place. We had a big landslide and you can see that in the middle block and the city of Edmonton backfilled it and then it continued to move down slope and you can see in the bottom photo the, the, the slumping, the failure that takes place and you can see where the river is. What that looks like today and what the city and the city engineers have done and I think that's really good is they've made Grierson Hill into a park. Minimal damage can occur on a park. The buildings are movement tolerant. If there's more slippage, we won't get as much damage to those buildings. They have put erosional riprap, those large boulders armoring um, the bank of the river to prevent erosion. So they're trying to prevent that Grierson Hill landslide from continue keeping to move. Um, this has got nothing to do with when banks fail, but it's such a beautiful shot or a beautiful drawing by Gabriel Ugueto who put these images into the book. And there's this American lion and it's just such a majestic beast. And he used to live in Edmonton. It used to live in Edmonton before and after the last glaciers, glaciations. And they found bones from that animal there. Such a great animal and such a great rendition. Let's go to Peace River up north. Um, again, we're gonna go to the 12 site, uh, 12 foot Davis site. And when you look at that river, what you see where I've labeled S's, slumps, failures, bank failures along that whole river valley, along the Peace River. It's being undercut and slumping down. Um, you can see the train trestle in the lower right. Well, the road leading to that train trestle is always, or the, the train tracks and the road leading to cross it are always moving due to slumping. Uh, it's the nature of the Cretaceous shales, 100 million year old shales more or less, as well as the glacial deposits. A very unstable area up there in that part of the world. Go to Crow's Nest Pass. Um, Crow's Nest is going to skip all over the province. Crow's Nest Pass shook violently. Um, and it looks beautiful. You can see it from space. Um, April 29th, 1903. It is Canada's largest landslide. The railroad and the highway were both blocked and half of the town of Frank was destroyed. At least, and we don't know for sure how many, at least 90 people died. And it's all to do with the geology. The rocks are folded, they were weakened, they were thrusted, they were pushed by the glaciers, or sorry, by mountain building processes. And then the area has been glaciated several times. And then you can see where I've labeled coal seam, coal mining probably contributed to the weakening and the failure of, of, Frank, of Turtle Mountain at the Frank slide to bring those boulders down which you see there, coming up on the other slope. So the scenic geology is a story of, as I said, unbridled power. It's a story of drama, a story of glaciers and volcanoes long past. And it's a story of when banks fail. It's a little bit of embellishment, uh, but the story, Alberta's scenery is so splendid. Um, and there's a lot to it, a lot to be learned. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Um, funding, and I have to acknowledge the Canadian Geological Foundation, they provided me with a book grant to publish the book. Uh, the book, again, is Scenic Geology of Alberta, a Roadside Touring and Hiking Guide. Lori. Yes. Hi. Hello. Uh, let's just see. I have some questions here for you, Dale. Uh, let me just uh, read here. Well, somebody wants to know, is that Red Rock Coulee in the background on your screen? Yeah, that is Red Rock Coulee. I've gained one of the more nicer spots, that land moonscape of Red Rock Coulee. Nice. 
Um, oh, no, 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 I got the podium, sorry. So those are concretions, sorry, Laurie. Yes, it is Rod Rock Cooley, and I talk about it in the, in the book, but they're, they're concretions. They're, they're chemical precipitates of calcite um, that form just below a shallow sea um, about 70 to 80 million years ago. And they're resistant to erosion and they're coming out of the banks and making their way down slope. So that's why, that's why you're seeing what you see there. I'm done there, Lori. Okay. Okay, great. Um, how did you decide what to include and exclude in your book? That was a very tough one because there are so many things, other things I could have included. Um, I really can't answer that. I went to a lot of spots that I was familiar with. I've been traveling across Alberta for 20 years, 30 years, and taking people um, for science, for training purposes to most of those spots. So I was familiar with them. Some I'd read about, and that made me go back and reread them. Um, Swan Hills, I'd always been intrigued with Swan Hills. Lesser Slave Lake, I was really intrigued with Lesser Slave Lake, spent no time. So I went exploring. There's sand dunes up there. And I wanted to talk, I told people about that. Uh, it was kind of willy nilly. The, I like Coal Lake. So some people might say it doesn't, it's not such a pleasing area to visit, but it's got a story to it. So I was writing the book, so I included Coal Lake in it. That's great. Um, so one more question, Penny would like to know, uh, was that volcano near Cranbrook Mount Baker? You're going to have to say that again, Lori, please. Was the volcano near Cranbrook, Mount Baker? No, it wasn't. And that brings up a good point that I never mentioned a minute ago. That volcano took place 103 million years ago, more or less. And then those deposits were buried kilometers and kilometers deep. And then they got pushed northeastwards. And, and this is an end to end story. And then in the last 60 million years, we had erosion. And those rocks, which were probably buried 10 to 15 kilometers deep, were eroded and came back to the surface. So not related to the volcanoes that we see today. Very good question. Great. Um, Tina would like to know, is there an off the path location that you wish more people knew about and visited? Yeah, really, 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 really. Mud Buttes, oh, I just lost it, uh, Neutral Hills, and Milk River Canyon. Writing on stone is in the Milk River Valley, but to me, the off the road ones are those three. And by talking about them, they're not gonna be on the unbeaten path anymore. But I think those are those, those three. If you wanna go and be more exotic, not many people go to Cold Lake and Muriel Lake. And there's a story there. Um, if you go further to the west along the central transect, very few people know about Sulphur Gates um, Provincial Recreation Area. Beautiful. Just, you know, it's such a beautiful spot in the Rocky Mountain foothills. So I'd say those who would encapsulate sort of the five answering your question. Planning the staycation right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is... Laurentide rather than Laurentian ice sheet, the prevailing name now in Canada? Uh, the Laurentide ice sheet, yeah, I would say so. And I will always defer to experts. I try and do as much research on this as I possibly can. Um, but yeah, we call it the, the Laurentide ice sheet. Um, and so I'm going to say yes. The, the gravels, they've got other names. I usually don't, don't see the, the name Laurentian gravels um, referred to very much. They've got other names. Okay, um, this is a good one. Do you have any of those paintings in your own personal collection? Any of those what? Paintings in uh, your book. No, I don't because I don't have very many walls in my house. And I kid you oh, not, windows. <laughs> I, when I say I have lots of windows and very few walls. Um, we've agonized over that, Marilyn and I, so. You wanna see the great outdoors. <laughs> yeah, I would. I, <laughs> It, give us time, it'll happen. But I, I have very little wall space. It's hard to imagine, but that is a fact. I have to put my grandkids' pictures up. Um, exactly, that's first. Um, some Sandy said, really enjoyed your enthusiasm and trying, um, tying in so many elements. So thank you for that. 
Um, Dale, if you had to pick one spot in Alberta to visit again, where would it be? So if you ask me that question today, and if you ask me that question tomorrow, it will be a different answer. Um, and so right now, if I had to answer that, and it's because I haven't been back up there, I'd like to go back to Grand Prairie and the Pipestone Creek. And I would like to go visit the dinosaur bones there. And you can only visit those again on a tour. And you have to find out if the museum's open to take people on tours. But that would be one. And again, one spot, but I'll extend it because I got the podium. Another phenomenal spot is at Warner. Um, and there you can go see the eggshells, the dinosaur eggshells. And that's really worth a trip. And again, you can only do that um, with the museum at Warner and it's got to be on a guided tour because we want to protect um, the dinosaur fossils. So I'd say those two. But if you ask me this tomorrow or in two days, I'll give you a completely different answer because they're also amazingly beautiful. All right, so is there a hike of decent length that incorporates the Bragg Creek Lookout? No, I'm gonna, uh, Bragg Creek Lookout, I'm gonna defer to others on that. So I'm gonna, Bragg Creek, nope, I'm gonna pass on that. I do not have that answer. Okay, somebody can answer it if they know. Yeah, please. Um, how do geologists distinguish between different ice sheets? Um, we can tell between the different ice sheets. The lower, there's the two ice sheets. I never really talked about it. You, some of you would have seen the images. There's the Cordilleran, meaning the mountain ice sheet, and there's the Laurentide ice sheet. The Laurentide ice sheet flowed from Northern Canada across Saskatchewan, and it eroded pink granite erratics. When you see pink granites in the till or in the surface, you know that it's the Laurentide ice sheet. There's only one or two areas that they come from the West. We have no granites coming from the West. Maybe somebody would say coming through Jasper, there might've been some, but no. Geologists look for those pink rocks. There's others, but we want the pink ones. As soon as you see that, that tells you that the rocks are from the Laurentide ice sheet. Um, when you don't have the pink ones, you know, there's more to it than this. When you don't have the pink ones, you're probably looking at the Cordilleran or the mountain glaciers. And they only extended, the mountain glaciers only extended out to the foothills. Um, some of them came to Calgary. The ones that came out of Jasper got as far as Hinton and a little bit beyond and were deflected to the south. Remember the story of the foothills erratic, erratic strain. So. Okay. Uh, what is your most favorite rock formation? Ooh. <laughs> the McDougall Seeger conglomerate. And the McDougall Seeger conglomerate is the one that is the basis of the Lost Lemon Gold Mine. So that's just an amazing story. So we went out there. This is when I used to work as a research scientist at the Geological Survey of Canada. And I just looked at all of the gravels and conglomerates in the Rocky Mountains. The only, and I worked with a gold scientist from New Zealand, uh, from Dunedin, and he came across and we just joined forces and we went exploring for gold. The only rocks we ever found any gold was in this McDougall Seeger conglomerate. I can list other names that didn't have them, but that doesn't matter. But to me, that gave a wee bit of substance, not a lot, but to that myth, that legend of the lost lemon gold mine. And then there's a little creek just outside of, uh, uh, um, sorry, sorry, the landfall, the Frank Slide Interpretive Center, and it's called Gold Creek. How did that name get there? Right above it is the McDougall Seeger conglomerate from which I have gotten gold grains. So that's my most, and again, cool. tomorrow I'll give you a different, favorite rocks, but that's good for now. That's a good start. Um, okay, here's a weather question, but she suspects the answer is geology related. Why is Calgary always so cold in the morning, regardless of a warm temperature the evening before? Oh, sorry, some of it's to do with, I'm gonna to defer to others. Some of it's to do with our elevation. We're, we're pretty high, um, but I'm gonna defer. I'm gonna let somebody else answer that one, I think. Uh, if I keep okay. going, I could get in trouble. Okay. Um, are you planning to launch similar books for other parts of Canada? 
Yes, uh, they take a lot of work, as you all know, Lori. So each book takes three to four years. Uh, to do a talk like I did today takes about a month of my life. So I want to work on this one for a while. Um, I'm considering one of two alternatives. One could be Saskatchewan. You could say, why? Nobody goes to Saskatchewan. I love the prairies. Or it might be a more detailed book on Calgary. Maybe a much thinner book, but I might do one on Calgary. And so it's lurking in the back of my mind. All right. Um, okay. Lots of very good, very nice, well done. Um, have you done any studies around Lethbridge and the Coolies? Um, no, not specifically on the Coolies, but um, it's the Coolies are what's called and referred to as Badlands terrain. Um, the the Lavarandre brothers, uh, when they were exploring in this late, I guess early 1800s probably, um, they came across Badland topography, which they called Le Mauvais Terrain in French, which translates into Coolies and Badlands. And so the reason they're there is it's where the Badlands are, is the bedrock is not very hard. It's not very tightly cemented. And so rain percolates into it. You start to get pipes, you start to get erosion, um, wind, thunderstorms that come through Alberta all summer can, can erode up to half a centimeter of material from the sides of the hills or from the tops of the hills. So not on the Lethbridge area specifically, but they're no different than the coolies in um, southern, further southern Alberta or along the Red Deer River Valley. Okay. Have you learned anything new or unexpected from looking at Alberta with tools like Google Satellite View? Yeah, you always get a different perspective and it gives you, you know, now Google um, Earth it's just so slick when you can rotate it around and put it into three dimensions. So yeah, you can trace beds, you can see things, you know, for a book like what I did, and I never put any Google Earth images into the book, uh, copyright reasons, um, but you can see so many things and I would use it on a regular basis to help me understand what I was looking at. Or if I was reading a scientific paper from the library, I would pull up a Google Earth image to help me look and see and put it into 3D to see what the authors, what the young, what the scientists were looking at. I found it a tremendous tool for that. Oh, that's great. Um, what would be the one geological feature I should not miss when I'm camping in Jasper this summer? Maline Canyon. Maline Canyon. So you're going to go to Jasper. Maybe you'll be there when I'm there. Who knows? Um, you go to Maline Canyon. First, you start very briefly. At, you go to Maline Lake. And Maline Lake has got caves at the bottom of it. And those caves drain Maline Lake and they flow for 16 kilometers. I gotta get my direction. Uh, sorry. They, they flow 16 kilometers to Maline Canyon, bottom of the canyon. And then there's so many more things to talk about there. Maline Canyon is a hanging valley and there's a story there. There's potholes in it. So do, do Maline Lake, Maline Canyon, and, and do the five or six bridges hike. And that'll just blow you away. I don't talk about it in my second book. You need both books. Yeah, take them both. It's a need. It's a need. So put, what you should have, and I think it, it counts for your book too here in Lori, somebody used, said, to put my book in your car library. So whenever I go traveling, I have my I have two or three or four favorite books. One's a bird book. I also have other books like protected in plastic bags in the back of my car, back seat of my car. That's my car library. If you drive around Calgary, have Lori's book too, but have mine as well as you drive around the province. A car library, I think, is a good way to describe it. It's, it's perfect. Um, I enjoy looking at the sandstone formations in Fish Creek Park. Any more information on those? Yeah, they're um, from their river, old river deposits. They're called um, the Pascapu Formation. And they are what we call meandering river deposits. So where you see the sands, they're what's called, they're point bars. They're the margins. Remember when I showed you the pictures of Edmonton and meandering river point bars? I used those words. Well, that's what those sandstones are at Fish Creek Park. And then 
Um, there's flood deposits and what we call crevasse plays, all sorts of deposits like that. Next time you go to Fish Creek Park, take a look at those rocks that you're looking on those cliffs. And that's where they want to put the green line, not in Fish Creek Park, but through rocks like that. That's why uh, sort of different problems have come up. I won't say much about that, but it's just kind of, those are the rocks through which the green line was proposed to tunnel. Um, and it's really, they're really interesting. So if I do another book, and I might, I will talk lots about Fish Creek Park. Huh. Well, that's great. Um, the Chert Quarry in Crow's Nest Pass, how did Chert occur? Chert, okay, so they, they forms in limestones and um, they, the limestones formed close to the equator uh, within 30 degrees north or south of the equator. And where those, lime, where those carbonate reefs that create the limestones, used to be carbonate reefs there of various types. And there were sponges that lived associated with the carbonate reefs. Um, the sponges are made out of silica, glass. And when the sponges died, the sponge spicules, the, 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 the parts of the sponges would dissolve and it would get transported as liquid silica, fluid silica. And then that silica would precipitate into those cherts, into those black, usually black cherts, but they may be different colors. Sometimes there's grays and greens as well. And so short answer, now that I've given you the long one, is the chert is dissolved in reprecipitated spicules from sponges. And I simplify it when I say that, but that's essentially what it is. All right. Um, if the foothills erratics train came from a single landslide onto the glacier, how come the rocks are spread over several hundred kilometers from north to south? Well, we don't know if it was one or if, there was, if they were ongoing or multiple. If you look at the picture, if you remember the picture that I showed you that came from the Alaska range, there were two back to back. So you could consider, consider it one big one. There was lots of freeze thaw activity going on. There was probably multiple landslides onto, um, on, onto the glaciers um, of those quartzites. And we know it's a very distinctive rock. And we know that it's something called a gog quartzite. When you go to Lake Louise and you go up hiking to the lake, to the, uh, to the tea house there, that's the gog quartzite. It's the same quartzite. So we know where it came from. We don't know for sure if it was just one landslide or if it was multiple. But look at it, it was probably hundreds of millions of tons of rocks fell onto the glacier at that, at that time or over several times. Uh, that's the best I could do there. Okay. What geological formation fascinates your grandchildren the most? Mm -hmm. Obviously anything with glaciers. Oh, uh, glaciers, why did I say that? Anything with dinosaurs. <laughs> anything with dinosaurs. So that's getting to the Horseshoe Canyon area uh, all along the Red Deer River Valley. They got a rock tumbler for Christmas, so they're into tumbling rocks. Well, you got to go get things like petrified wood, which we can find around Alberta, or geodes, which you might get from Mexico, but um, agates if you go work in the gravel pits. So they like gravel pits too, because they're looking for those really hard rocks, which they can polish and tumble. Very cool. Um, you related a couple of good stories relating geology to First Nations storytelling. Are there a lot of other similar stories? Yeah, there is. There is. And I sometimes I would make reference just, I don't have a lot of that in the book, but I do have some. And sometimes it's a one liner. Um, the Neutral Hill story is what they call unattributed. They really don't know for sure if that is this story as it's come down through the records. The, the stories from writing on Stone Provincial Park, it would be considered as attributed. Uh, the Okotoke story is considered as attributed um, you know, to, to, to lore or to the creation of the earth. Where I, sometimes I just might have one line or two lines. Sometimes it's, a histor it's another um, historical anecdote that I'll put in. If I could get some information uh, to make it interesting from a non-geological perspective, I often would put it in there. Okay. Um, how old is the Pascapoo Formation? I'm going to arm wave. It's, 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 it, it extends across the Cretaceous into the Paleogene, and it's about 70 
to 60 million years. And I don't want to be held, but that gives you a range, 70 to 60 million years. Um, it just gets into um, after the dinosaurs passed away. Uh, so again, it's just a memory thing and I can't remember all of the ages. That's why when you, if, you, if you look on my slides, I've always got my little crib sheet notes to, that I can refer to, but I hope that answered the question sufficiently. That gives oh, you a, yeah. broad, a, broad, a broad range. Um, in any future books editions, it would be great if you touched on the amylite deposits near Lethbridge. If, if what? You touched on the amylite deposits oh, uh, near right. Lethbridge. Yeah, but there is no yabots, but there is a yabot on this one. That's in private land. Yes, and I fully agree with what you're saying. And I could have done that and, and I thought about it, but it's 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 not like our gap, it's not, it's, it, it's mined, it's private property. Um, people get busted there on a regular basis, not for stealing fossils necessarily from the Alberta government, but from stealing or taking um, the amylite gemstones from what is considered as leased land. I, I did put some thought into that at the time because it's such a spectacular area and uh, the amylites are so neat to see. Good, good great question. And I will fire that yeah. for next time. Okay, good. Um, why are the boulder concretions at Red Rock Coulee so spherical? Um, they're, it's interesting. They're spherical, we think, and I say we meaning scientists, and I didn't study them, but I read about them because they formed just below the seafloor in not very deep water. And therefore the pressures were equal um, vertically as well as horizontally and diagonally. And so what we think is they formed just below the seafloor, and that could be a few tens of meters, meters to a few tens of meters, um, not hundreds to thousands of meters. And so that's why they're so spherical. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna just, um, add, I'm gonna add something to that too because I got the podium. Um, they're made out of calcite and that calcite, there's a little bit of something we call siderite. Um, it forms really early um, when you start to bury the sediment within just a few years. I'm not saying the concretions formed, they're one to five meter size in a few years, in a few years, but they started to form just after a few years of burial. But just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay. Um, Kleskin Hills near Grand Par Prairie, how were these formed? You know, they're kind of, somebody asked me the question a minute ago, a few minutes ago, about the coolies in um, Lethbridge area. It's really the same process. We're seeing erosional remnants of a much vaster landscape. The Kreskin Hills, um, the sands and the ground, the sands and the muds aren't very deeply cemented. Uh, I don't consider it as Badlands terrain up there, but it's almost like Badlands terrain. It's upper Cretaceous, non-marine, meaning rivers, lakes, floodplains, deposits that were never buried very deep. And I don't, we've never seen a number for there, but probably one to three kilometers of material have been eroded from above Kreskin Hills in the last 60 million years, more or less. And they're just the preserved remnants of those hills, of, of our, sorry, of a much broader landscape. I hope I answered the question there. Okay. Um, why is Rumsey natural area so rolling, kettle terrain? Uh, it's, it's if, if you remember what I talked about and alluded to an Elk Island National Park, um, it's basically a, a big block of ice, part of the glacier when it was melting and receding back, um, melted in place. And so the ice melted, there was dirt on top of the ice, the dirt would shift and roll and just keep moving around like that. And then where the final low-lying areas were, were probably where the last of the, lar of the ice blocks were situated. They melted out in place and that became the little lakes and little potholes that we've got. Okay. Um, is the tunnel along the Crypt Lake Tyke and Waterton naturally formed? If so, what caused that? Oh Lord, um, I can't give you that answer. Number first of all, I'll give, I can answer the first part. Yes, it is naturally formed. Why it formed, I do not have that answer. So I will not even extrapolate. So okay, all right. What I have, um, a, I have a philosophy. 
If I know the answer, I'll tell it to you. If I don't know, I'm not going to bleep. I'm not going to stretch it. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I think lots of lots of people thanking you and enjoyed the presentation uh, a lot, and we'll be exploring um, the province because of you. And look forward to getting your book. And I think that's it for the direct questions. Um, somebody can't wait to add the book to his car library. He just said um, so. Yes, awesome presentation. Um, I think I think we got everything. Great job. Thank you very much, Lauren.